And from that point onward, anyone in touch with the intellectual community could not deny that the Earth was a sphere and that it was finite. It wasn't flat. It didn't go on forever. You start off in one direction, you, and you'll come around back to where you began. Now, in 1798, Thomas Malthus uh, used mathematics in order to, to work up an understanding of, of ecologically, cosmologically, ethically, what does this mean? Why is there death in the world? And what he did is he calculated the rate of population growth, the geometric rate of population growth. What would happen if you have birth and birth and birth and birth, but never death? How quickly Earth would become overpopulated by everything if there was no death. This book, incidentally, was extremely important for Charles Darwin. He was, when he was thinking about, in the beginning in the 1830s, uh, thinking about his understanding of evolution by natural selection. This understanding, reading Thomas Malthus' books, was crucial for him. Death is necessary on a finite planet. 1859, Charles Darwin. Uh, anybody know what insect this is that I collected? Cicadas. Happened to be there during a mass of cicada uh, coming out of the ground and, um, you know, they, they have no feeding parts as adults. Uh, they just die after they reproduce. But I, I just collected these on the sidewalk and I thought it would be fitting to put it around this picture of Darwin. After all, it's death of individuals and death of species that has a creative role to play in the complex life and in the coevolution of different species with one another, the fitting in with the ecology of the planet. Let's take a look at a beautiful story, one of the many, many mythic stories of indigenous and religious peoples around the world of trying to explain how death came into the world. I mean, any of the major cosmological questions that children ask and inevitably ask, why does grandma have to die? must have an answer. That's what our religions are for. That's what our mythos is for, to provide that answer, a satisfying answer, with the best understanding of the world that we have at the moment. Here is how they explain death. Great Spirit said to the people, you have a choice. You can either have immortality or you can have children. Choose. Well, the people started arguing back and forth and back and forth, and finally, the grandmothers all stepped aside, sat in circle, and the answer was unanimous. Came back. We choose children. And that's how death came into the world. Again, in a kind of an intrinsic understanding that if you live in one valley and there's another tribe over in that valley and another tribe over here and over here, you cannot overpopulate your range. You cannot overhunt your buffalo. You cannot overhunt your deer. That's what death is for, to have the ecological balance. How does our culture's creation story explain death? Our Western Judeo-Christian uh, Islamic culture, the peoples of the book, how is death explained? Well, in Genesis. We have the story of Adam and Eve and the apple and the snake being tempted. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered this world, and by sin death, so death passed upon all men. That is, when Adam disobeyed God and ate the apple at the bequest of Eve, and thereby, thereby disobeyed God's strictures, that's when the fall happened. That's when God punished the people by having death come into the world. This is a poster taken at the New Creation Science Museum down in the Cincinnati area. Michael and I have been there several times. And it's an extraordinary museum that integrates creation science, which is a young Earth, the Earth is only 6,000 years old, created exactly the way it says in Genesis, integrates religion and beautiful pictures of volcanoes and fossils and all that kind of stuff, but interpreting it from this young Earth perspective. There's a poster here on death. Let's see what it says about death before Adam's sin and after Adam's sin. Before Adam's sin, there was no death. According to the Bible, animals and humans have life, but plants do not. So humans and animals were created to eat plants, 
And in the original world, before sin, humans and animals would never die. After Adam's sin, death was introduced after Adam's sin. Death of humans is a judgment on man's rebellion. Death is our enemy, according to the Apostle Paul, which invaded God's very good creation. Death is our enemy. This is an attempt to react to a sense that if you go, if you step into that scientific world view and embrace evolution, your children are going to learn, lose their faith. They're going to lose their faith in God. They're going to lose their faith in having an afterlife that you ought to believe correctly in order to be able to get to. Very understandable why this happens. Now here's a generous inter interpretation of the Genesis story that just three weeks ago a woman told me after my Death Through Deep Time Eyes sermon, she said, Connie, I have another interpretation of that Genesis story. And here's how she said it. As soon as Eve was created and they saw one another, well obviously this is a metaphor for sex, okay? Once they started having sex, there were going to be babies. And once there were babies, you'd have to have the death of elders. Isn't that lovely? So here's a way to be able to take that Genesis story and make an interpretation that comports with the science. Frankly, though, I like to start with the science, start with stardust, and not try to find a way to mesh it into the Genesis story. But hey, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. I can do that. What are the consequences of a punishment view of death? What if this young earth creationist view of death has inculcated much of our culture? Some of us surely have experienced the, the negative effects of this. I certainly did when my mother and I had to fight to get her the medication she needed in order to be able to die at home the way she wanted to die. Whereas her doctor viewed death as sort of the fail at failure. Keep alive at any cost, no matter what the suffering, no matter what. What would our culture be like if we had the Iroquois creation story, if that was part of our ancestry? What would it be like saying goodbye to the elders? A woman who attended a death sermon that I gave in a church, Unitarian Universalist Church, sent me this email afterwards. She said, I'm a funeral director intern and will be getting my license within the next couple of months. Every day I deal with death. Every day I hear sermons about Adam's sin and death's sting. I always feel strange sitting at the back listening to whichever preacher happens to be the pick of the day. I always knew I didn't believe what they spoke. I learned about evolution on the Discovery Channel. I believe it, but I have never had it put into a story that could define me. It was always distant, something that happened in the past. You brought to me the first creation story that I could relate to. No talking snake in a tree tempting a nude woman. No, you gave me words to a story that is based in fact, something I can make my own, something that is my own, and for that, I thank you. Emails and responses like this are what keep Michael and me on the road. Were death banished from this fine planet, Immortality would thus reign. No more death, but no more children. Finite landscapes so would proclaim. Death in this new view helps us all to do aging possessed of a fair dignity. Goslings in spring and ponds teeming with polyoli walks. From now on through eternity. Goslings in spring and ponds teeming with polyoli walks. From now on through eternity. <laughs> Thank you.